everyone. Welcome to Creative Conversations of David and Donna for like what the 29th week in a row it's now. So exciting. Very much so. We're almost at 30. This is this is Yay. David and Donna. And welcome to Creative Conversations of David and Donna. This is David <laughs> and Donna. I had to say it again because for a second I was like, wait, what do I say next? So I just repeated. <laughs> I just That's kept. That's a going. very David thing to do. It is a very, very David, David thing David to do. Thing. I'm okay with that though. Oh, I am too. Works for me. Yeah. So right before uh, we started recording the day, we were um, we were having some conversations about YouTube and and how I was showing her some of the more popular YouTube videos and and popular YouTube channels and um, and I just saw this look of pure confusion on your face. <laughs> he was so right. I'm not, I, yeah, I was absolutely confused. Just these videos I was showing her. Uh, I'm not going to mention specifically who, but um, family vlogger channels of uh, and the popular ones like that mm -hmm. and. Um, and stuff like that, and just the crazy things that they're doing, right. and I, I believe you said you're like, I just don't know why people would watch this, exactly. and I'm like, people eat this stuff up. I never watched some of the, the stuff we were I was showing you, but I, I I've watched some things that if I showed you, you'd probably be like, you are subscribed to this channel. Mm -hmm. How does he, how do they make money off of this thing? I've, and it's, I've heard, it's really wild. Yeah, you know, as a high school teacher, I've, I've seen and heard. And of course, my daughter is still in high school, and people show me stuff, and I, I just have this very confused look on my face. What? Yeah. What am I looking at? Okay, boomer. I know, and I, I'm okay with that one. Because yeah, it's, that's it's like just memes changed. you don't understand, but oh. this is. The stuff we were showing you is just like weird. Like some of the videos that I've seen, um, a big really popular ones like vloggers, the big ones when they, um, like a video I saw was just insane stuff, and and it, it's okay. One of them was um, this group of friends had like a building in a university like rented out, right, completely empty, and it was night, and they played hide and go seek, and whoever won. Got a million dollars. How? Where did the money come from? Because they're rich and they make these videos. Like they had like 20 million subscribers. <sighs> also like sponsorships or whatever. I don't know where the money comes from. It might not even be true. But then again, they open up a briefcase full of freaking money. And based on the subscribers they have and the merch they sell and everything like that. And I, be I, I believe them. Especially because a way people make money like that is they get like uh, nine-year-olds who love them. And then they beg for their mom's credit cards to mm. buy them t-shirts and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. But, um, like, insane stuff like that. Um, another one similar was uh, people, like, they got on a swing and they just were swinging. And it's, like, last one to stop swinging gets $500,000 or whatever. And it's, like, and it's just the friends. You're just putting them through this stuff. And I was watching some podcasts myself with conversations about this. And it is straight up, like, this is, like, you know what the next step from that is? Is the Hunger Games. Yeah, <laughs> like, I agree with like, that. Like, you're playing these games where it's, like, how long before somebody's, like, you know what, this is boring. Okay, uh, for, first one to shoot somebody else in the face, million dollars. <laughs> and there are people who are just, like, okay, just, <laughs> before the sentence is even done, they're shooting someone else in the face. Mm -hmm. And But pe that's what is super big on YouTube, and people eat that stuff so up. So there are challenges for money. Yeah. Challenges for money. But what we were looking at had nothing to do with that. It no, no, it didn't. It was kind of no. everyday life. And we, were, we, were, we were watching family vloggers. Family vloggers. And, and, and how they make videos where they just, like, film their kids doing crazy things and being, quote-unquote, funny. So I didn't find it very funny. Did you uh, find it funny? No, not at all. No, yeah, I didn't. I didn't either. <laughs> not um, at all. So I'm confused too. Well, not confused, but you told me that this has been like YouTube families have been a thing for easily 10, 15, yeah, twenty. Do we know? Uh, uh, ten years because YouTube. YouTube was around in like two thousand six. And then, so okay. I'd say probably, yeah, at least 10 years. Okay, so... 15, maybe. So it wasn't until maybe a month ago-ish that they came out with the whole we aren't making content for children. Right, climate. okay, so I, from my understanding what that is basically was um, there's this new law, we have to declare our channel, uh, that we do not make videos for children. And, uh, was it for children or of children? Um, now I, but I, this is, this is, this is a great conversation. Cause actually I told you, I think that I confused myself telling you a little bit about that. So the thing we had to declare on YouTube was not making videos for kids. And what that does is that influences the ads that go on our okay, channel. I understand that. Now the thing about making videos of kids, that actually became a big deal because 
there was this YouTube, and you know what, um, I'll say the name because it was such a big controversy in the news, and they don't really do anything anymore because of the crap. Uh, Daddy05 was this YouTube channel. It was a family vlogger, like the stuff we were watching. Um, and some people started calling out some of the crazies that they would do on the channel because to make videos, they would do things like pull pranks on their kids. Like one of the videos, for example, was they, a, one of their kids got in trouble for spilling something in his room. So what they did was they went and they spilled soda in his room and then were like, you spilled this, didn't you? Like, and he's like five. And they're just start screaming. And it's like horror. Like I watched, I watched this video. Absolutely like disgusting. Like they're screaming at him like, you spilled it. No, you spilled it. And the kid's just crying. He does, he's like, I didn't spill it though. And like, and they're like, ha, we pranked you. And it goes on YouTube and they make millions of dollars or whatever because people watch that for some reason. Um, another one, um, and, and so that's what like that's what's going on there. And so uh, also there was this big controversy where literally, and this is some this is some we're getting some controversial controversial conversations, but literally um, pedophiles were watching these videos of these kids and leaving comments like it was like a porn site basically for them. It's like it's it's like content where they get to look at the kids and. Or maybe like the kids that they're filming a kid's dance recital and they're like it, it just disgusting things like that, right? And they got called out. And that was actually caused what's called the apocalypse. Because this guy called that out. It was like, hey, this is happening. This is not good. So when this guy made a video calling that out, most of the advertisers on YouTube were like, Wait, what? YouTube is like a platform that allows this to happen? We're pulling our ads. We don't want our ads on here. So then all these advertisers pulled their ads and then all these other YouTube, all the YouTubers like were like, oh crap, they did that because they just lost all their money from the ads and it caused the apocalypse. So that led into a law where basically um, you can't, if you're putting your children, your, your kids in videos, you have to declare that that's, you have to declare that it's for kids and that kids are in the video. Um, and that's where it comes into where basically if kids are in the video, you have to sort of declare this is for kids. And when you do that, comments are disabled. disabled right. Comments are disabled. There is no like or dislike ratio, um, stuff like that. And um, also, like I think, what it does now is you can still make money off of them, but it limits the advertisers that are on that channel. And, and if you falsely, if you say no, it's not for kids. I mean, or if you say yes, it's for kids, and it's like you know um like not for kids there's like a forty thousand dollar fine that you get slapped with instantly no questions asked same thing other way around if you're like yeah it's it's it, it's it's for kids and it's not or if you say no it's not for kids but you're putting kids in it and like exploiting because what what that what the channels like daddy of five are doing where they were straight up exploiting their children who just want to like you know play with crayons or whatever yeah. to make money and it's just, it's just like this like it's it's almost abusive like putting their yeah, there's no and, and, and it became well that's the thing that's that's what's so interesting is that now it was that all started like in 2007 ish so we're just now getting to the point where we can see what effect that had on children on kids who grew up as youtube families and kids mm -hmm. who grew up like with a camera on them all the time and now they're old enough to come out and say yeah that was miserable that was terrible i didn't i lost a childhood it's a different it's it's the same thing that like when child actors where it became yes. a big deal and, was and that's that controversy. still a problem and that's still a problem you're right it's still a problem and it's the same thing now but just any parent with a camera can do that to their kids and i mean i've dealt with that personally like not like okay like people or i've there have been things where People that I know around me have had their lives kind of messed with because of the way media works now where nothing is private, nothing is left alone. Kids don't get to make mistakes privately anymore. No one gets to learn. It's all out there. And and everything they did as a kid is just up on the internet. Um, you meet a boyfriend, you go on a date, that boyfriend can look you up and find you in this video when you were five years old doing something embarrassing and stupid and like... I don't know, throwing poop on the wall or something, you yeah, know, like, okay, okay. it's crazy stuff like that. And, and it's having enough real effect. So that's been a problem. Also, I'm, I know I've been rambling on, but there's just so much because this is another thing. There were these really weird videos called toy channels. You ever heard of toy channels? No. Toy channels were this thing going on where basically 
just this bizarre, weird, creepy thing, and they're all the same, that kids ate up. They would take toys, and these, like, grown freaking men would, like, take, like, these children's toys, and they would cut them open, and, and like, and dissect them, and, like, play with them, and, like, do, like, a toy, toy channel. And then also, they'd make sketch videos of, like, that were just weird things that were made to beat the algorithm and attract children, where they would do, like... Spider-Man, Elsa, pregnant. Like, that's what the video would be called. Spider-Man, Elsa, pregnant versus battle. And it's like, what? And it's the video where Elsa, like, from Frozen, yeah. this is this grown woman dressed as Elsa, is pregnant, and Spider-Man's there. This guy dressed as Spider-Man, and he's like, who? Huh? You're pregnant? Oh, no, I got you pregnant. And then they have a baby, and then it's this weird thing where the, under the chest they pull out a baby doll, and it's like... Spider-Man and Elsa have a baby. What? That's so crazy. And then, like, they, like... Like, there are videos where they just, like, dry hump each other. And it's like, what the frick? Like, this weird child, like... What? And people are making millions off of this. So who was watching it enough to make... Children. Remember earlier today, when we were talking about how two-year-olds know how to just get on a yes. YouTube, on the phone? Yes. I personally, like, I've like, walked into my living room and seen my five-year-old sister, like, watching these toy review channels... And it's because, and you look at the suggested, and it's and it's all suggested because these people who make them have made the exact titles and the exact tags to pop up on like Disney Channel. Like recommend, like if you watch it, if a child watches a Disney Channel video, and this is what's going to pop up in the recommended. And this was this is what was happening. They've kind of like made it like no, you can't do that anymore. Uh, and. So they would click on it because they're like Elsa, Spider Man. I okay, and they're just like mindless two year olds clicking videos, and they're just clicking videos, clicking videos, clicking videos, clicking videos. Ads are playing on those videos, and these people are just racking up the cash because of these two year olds who have their mommy's phone, and are just like clicking on these different videos that pop up that have crazy thumbnails like what toys? Oh, that's a dinosaur. I like dinosaurs. Oh my god! And they click on it and. So the person who is stuff. making it, it's simply clickbait so they can make money. But yes. is there a, a, another more awful intent? I mean, you're talking about dry humping and... O often there is. Because that's where it would come in that... Um, that's where it would come in that pedophiles were using YouTube as like a place to get that kind of content. And and then like the sinister... I. I I guess when it comes to the videos where, like, Elsa and Spider-Man are dry humping each other, I guess the sinister part there is that if you have that in the thumbnail, or, like, them pushed up next to each other, kids are going to be, like, confused and curious. Yeah. And so they're clicking on the video for that. That's just another clickbait thing. It, it just... It just takes a sick mind. I mean, I guess... Absolutely People, people will do anything for money, but... So, if I could try to stay positive, like we talk about on our right, other podcast... Yeah. What are things that you can do to to get people watching that are not despicable, right? Or stupid, or, right? Or well, the best thing to do, okay? Because we were talking about this also, like people are just doing these stupid things that are following these trends that are just growing these channels, and it's like it's all clickbait. And what can you do? We've talked about this before a little bit. How one of my favorite channels they don't they have like eighty thousand subscribers, but they make plenty of money because what they've done is they've just they make videos about comic books and they have strictly stuck to their formula for, for five years they make videos about comic books and in doing so even though it's a slow ground even though they're not getting the clickbait titles coming in every five seconds and all that big money they have built up this organic mm -hmm. very real audience mm -hmm. of active people who actively support the channel and because they do that they're going to watch every video they're gonna like every video they're going to donate to their patreon and buy their merch and mm -hmm. there's something called super chats where if you're doing a live stream on youtube and you want your chat at like the top like the pop up like in a message board on so they instantly see it you can pay like a dollar and just like boom it's right there or you can just give them money because you're fans of them mm -hmm. and they and by building up that fully organic real audience not doing the clickbait they've had the same success and then at the same time, doing what they love, which is making videos about comics, not having to do clickbait, not having to do this weird stuff. Thankfully, no channel can really ex exploit the children viewers in the same way um, that they were before. Uh, because, you know, the, the, if, if someone is making a toy review channel, 
like they were all toy channels where they would do that kind of stuff. I was just telling you about, and they say it is for kids. Well, what's happening now is they have a lot less ads that are showing up on that video, and so they're making a lot less money. So it's not viable to do that now. It does so. It's they're, so they're not doing it as much because they, they don't they don't they don't, they don't care. They're just doing it to get more views, and if they're not making money. Then what's the point of doing it? So it takes that away and okay. kind of faces the whole problem. So if there are was a group of mothers who, in fact, wanted to make a toy review channel yeah. to help other mothers or whatever. Right. Is that viable? Um, it is viable. You can make money, but you just can't necessarily exploit like they were doing. Um, I, I see what you're trying to say mm -hmm. here. Like, a genuine, like, hey, mothers, is this toy safe for your children? Yeah, is it appropriate? Is, is it, it appropriate? Yeah. yeah. In fact, you could probably even say this video is not for children. You could okay. probably you could probably okay. fit that in the category. Okay. But right. if you want to say this is for children, then you would just not make as much money, but you could still make money mm -hmm. from doing well, that. That. Would, that would not be for children. It wouldn't be. But I see what you're saying, though. Yeah. If they genuinely um, wanted to mm -hmm. make like, car or okay, if somebody like animates cartoons and wants to animate cartoons for children, yes, they can make they can make the they can make money off of it. They can make a normal amount of money off of it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's, um, coming in from advertisers. It just might not, you just can't do the exploitation of having a million kids clicking all the time because there's not going to be as many ads overall. And so the whole idea of just getting clicks, 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 clicks isn't going to work mm -hmm. from kids playing on their mommy's phones and, and, and you know when it, i've seen stuff like that where you don't necessarily have to declare it a, a kid's video just because it's an animated cartoon you could say there's a lot of animators on youtube actually and you could you could say no this isn't for children it's just it's just um it just is and kids can still watch something if it's not for children like you can still find it on youtube and in that case what happens there if it's if if they say, no, it's not for kids, but kids still watch it, that's fine because then if an actual claim gets filed against the video, like it gets reported and a YouTube moderator watches it, they can say for themselves, okay, there's nothing inappropriate happening here. It's okay that we run on normal ads on it. This is all from my understanding of the mm -hmm. law, but I think I've, I think I've got a, somewhat of a grasp on it. Well, I mean, even I have to, are you 18 years old, confirm your age. So is that right. more prevalent now than it used to be? Um, Probably, yeah. I've, yeah, you're right. I've seen that. I've seen that pop up a lot more where it's like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's age-restricted video, got to be signed in. And it's like, age-restricted video? Okay. That makes sense. I mean, there's just so much always. And we've talked about this before, too, mm -hmm. how... When books first came out and all those kids sitting around reading books and then they were watching or listening to the radio, then they were watching the TV and now they're on their phones or it was video games before the phones. But the phone is a lot different. It's more, I don't know the correct it, word. It, it is it, more um, extreme of a change mm -hmm. than not reading books to reading books to now having anything in the world. You know how easy a child could accidentally type in porn? Absolutely. You know, just out of out of the blue especially if they have a like if they're on their parents phone that doesn't have like because you can put like child restrictions mm -hmm. but you don't have your own you don't have restrictions on your phone right. unless you want to i guess but no i hear what you're saying it's, it's just yeah it is access crazy how media has changed like that yeah yeah access to anything is easier. anything in the and world so yeah. disturbing images and it's a very overall i think it's a good thing but there are downsides to it and mm -hmm. things that are like you got to be like a little that are a little concerning and the and also just the exploitation of mm -hmm. children who have phones who um are clicking on these videos and and people making money off of that kind of stuff and you know kids can learn pretty easily how things work like that oh uh, absolutely they get really um i don't think they, i don't think kids get enough credit Oh, because, I, I mean, I, I mean, I give them credit, but I agree with right, you. people yeah, don't I, understand what they can do. Right? Like, for example, where it's like kids can figure out if you're just letting them play on your phone, kids can figure out, oh, if they're playing a game on your phone, they can go, oh, I can get more gaming time if I just buy this new thing that's popped up. You know, get, you know, you're playing a game and ads mm -hmm. come up. 
if I just buy the full version of the game, well, I don't got to put, okay, pr- buy. And then it's just like, okay, well, your card's already on your phone, so boom, you just bought a $5 game. You know, lots of stuff's happened where, where kids buy like 500 bucks worth of stuff with their iTunes account, and then the parents are like, um, I'd like a refund, and they're like, no, man, don't give your kids your Apple password, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's some crazy stuff. It is crazy, man. Crazy. It is crazy, man. And we're out here just trying to make <laughs> videos. And, you know, that's the thing. We could try to exploit. And, I mean, we, we tag things in our videos. Don't get me wrong. but um, Well, that's just good business. That's, that's just good business, yeah. yeah like, and, But I think that I, I would rather, like, grow an organic audience. And, you know, I do want to do things that hit big and get people to view it. But... I think having a more an organic audience is probably more valuable and more mm-hmm. sustainable. Absolutely. Um, because you know, you also you know how the ad pocket. I was just telling you like ad pocket, they called it, where you people pull their ads from YouTube. That could happen at any moment. Absolutely. And YouTube could just completely say, could, nah, yeah. just go away. And that's the thing. I read this channel I'm talking about a lot of channels where they build this organic audience. They they can say, well, if that happens, I think we'll be okay. Because I know I have this audience who's going to still watch my videos and they'll buy my merch and they will donate to my Patreon. And if YouTube just up and disappears one day, well, they know that I have a Facebook where they can go and find me on Facebook where we'll start making videos there or on Twitch. Or you can go to our Instagram and figure out exactly where or we are. Or our website. Or our website. Yeah. I mean, we could always just do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, it. It's crazy how YouTube works, and I have yet to wrap my head around it. I mean, I sort of get it, but um, what I've sort of discovered and what I think is true is that when it comes to what we're doing, since we're not trying to like, literally break the algorithm and give it to kids, you can do any little tricks you want. You can follow all the, well, you're going to put in the playlist and blah, blah, blah. And yes, those could help. And you could do all of that, but it isn't going to matter unless you're making something that connects to somebody mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've seen things where um, someone made a good point where you can watch these channels that have 5 million subscribers, but then you look at their videos, they get 100,000 views. What that means is that a year ago, they did something really good and got 5 million subscribers, but they stopped doing that thing, so those 5 million subscribers don't watch it anymore. Mm. They just, I have plenty of channels where I make a joke, like, I'm, st- I'm still subscribed out of respect, but I don't watch them because... I'm just not interested anymore, but there are channels that I've watched like 10 years ago that I'm still subscribed to just because I'm like, uh, I get nostalgic about it and, and that can happen. And, and, um, if you just, like I just said, if you're trying to hit those things, it's not going to matter unless you make something that people want to watch and that's going to connect with them. And, well, and, what I've learned, cause I've done so much I got taken so many online classes or yeah. whatever. It's about adding value. So what can we do mm-hmm. to add value? So David and I were actually talking about this before we recorded today. It's like, well, what are we going to talk about? I don't know. And so for positive, I feel like we, we know what that's about. We both, uh-huh. and I think David, because of me, largely, but just we just have this positive outlook. And I, I try to share it with everybody I can. And it's it's been fun for me to watch my way of dealing with things positively rub off on David to the point that now he says stuff that rubs off on me positively. Yeah. So it's, it's very cool. But we know it that that's, true. that's a thing that we have to offer. It's a very clear direction. We never have to discuss what are we going to talk about in positive mm-hmm. conversations. But for creative, it's just when we decided to do a podcast, it was kind of grown out of the idea that we were going to do a talk show. And the idea there was to interview people who were creative and just like any other talk show you'd see on TV. Well, you know, that's something we do continue to do is like give people a way to tell the world about their creative ideas. Let us tell you about our creative ideas, but it it hasn't quite hooked into what I think it's going to ever like take off to be. I think everything we talk about is interesting. It's interesting to us for sure. And when I look back on it or listen back on it, I, I enjoy every conversation, but, um, it, it's just like anybody else trying to get a foothold in the business world. It's like, where, where do we, you know, where do we really take off? And it, it's coming. It's just, we're doing all of our back work right now. <laughs> and if nothing else, we're getting used to the, to the way we sound when we talk to the, to what we think is a good one. And 
you know, just... I think the way that we're doing things is just, like you said, we're building up this mm-hmm. this, this really good platform. And, you know, usually the way things work with podcasts is you have a normal size, like, 10-minute video, and people like you, and then you make a podcast where people go through because podcasts and draw it in. That's just not what we did, but... I think it's something we will do. I do too. Where we will have an idea for a video that we make. And it's, but also we're just so busy. Um, but we will, we will be able to make a video that is not a podcast that then gets views. And then they can go, wow, I want to check out more of this stuff. And then, mm-hmm. oh, look, there's all these podcasts that are there that they can go through and, and like. And everything is going to be okay. I have no doubt in my mind. Me too. Nowadays, I mean, I did for a long time, but nowadays, I'm all, I'm all Gucci. I'm like, I'm it's it. all good. It's all, I'm, all, I'm on it. Where it's like everything, it's work that is going to pay off because it has to. Like, how does it not? It's yeah, it's, gonna. it's like anybody who's ever hit it big with a podcast. It, it took them a while, and then you, you find them, and then you realize, wow, they've been recording for two years, and nobody heard anything they said. But now, boom! Look, look what they did. So right, we're we're past our half year mark. We're we're, and we're doing right, so much else. So much else, right? Well, let me well. let me comment about something if I can get my my head back to it. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was a thought I had, and I think I lost it. And maybe it'll come back. Uh-oh. No, I know what it was. It was about our uh, Donna Method course that we're going to do. We are going to do that. I think that's going to have to be our summer project. I think you're right. But the uh, the Donna Method that we want to put out there, and we've talked about, and that will definitely be one of our cornerstones once we get it up and available, is just how I think when I write. And I've I've come to realize after watching the play that we staged already this year, Vlad and Alex, now I'm starting to work on our second play which is the uh, updated Romeo and Juliet to the 60s, the River and Juliana, I, I really personally feel like I've continued to improve the Donna Method to write. And so David and I right now, since we're offering our services on fiber as writers, I was thinking about what we were doing before the podcast, which is working on content for some writing that somebody asked us to do. So David has some ideas. And what I find myself doing anytime I collaborate with somebody is like, Okay, tell me some more. All right, well, who is this character? Well, well what do they want? Well, well, how does that relate to... And I, I just find that I'm the, I'm the person who's able to, to really find a direction. And I feel like I just know the, the questions to ask. And David had a lot of good ideas and he had written a whole lot of stuff down. But for me to come in and, and help with that, the way my brain functions is, well, wait... No, wait a minute. Okay, who are these people? What are their names again? How old are they? Now, what is this? And how are we going to go back to that? And You're the director. I, I am. I, it, and I feel like being the director is what helps you be the good writer. Donna so, the director. Yeah. So it's the Donna method in, in many number of ways. But I should get you a plaque. <laughs> well, what are some of the things that you heard me ask and you were talking about that you hadn't really thought of when you were working on it by yourself? You built up this whole world for these characters that we're probably never going to see in this thing that we're doing. It's never going to come into play directly, but by building up that world, um, it, it allowed these questions to be answered and figure out. And then from there you could, you could, you would know what to do. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we did. We knew what to do where we, you asked the questions or just basic stuff. And, and, and I mean, I think that's how I, that's how I write D and D games mm-hmm. actually, where mm-hmm. I build up a world. And uh, it's a joke. We're actually like, in the same way, like we're never going to use most of the stuff you said is never going to directly be used, but it's there to fill in what is going to be used. And um, in my D and D games, I have a notebook full of information about this world that my players never get to know about because they just don't. It just doesn't come into play, mm-hmm. but it's there, and that's how we sort of feel here, where we're like, okay, well. Did she have a best friend? Okay, well, does Gab- what does Gavin miss about um, mm-hmm. about his old school? And so why is he upset about it? And and we're never going to mention Gavin's old pal Pete or whatever, but but we know that it exists. So then whenever we're writing the words for Gavin, we, it fits in in between the lines. Mm-hmm. And it helps. And, and we could write so much quicker. Yeah, the broad base yeah. gives us an easier way to... To jump forward, it, it's it's really important to me. Like when I was working this um, Christmas for writing a 60s play. I mean, I was born in 65, but I had to go back 
for myself. And I mean, I watched mm-hmm. hours of documentary video about hippies, about just how people who were born in the 50s but raised as teenagers in the 60s, just the the very strict rules of the 50s and how the 60s came around and changed all that. And I listened to 60s music and... I'm telling you, having all that in my brain just absolutely made it so much easier to be authentic when I was writing the play. And so basically, I guess the bottom line is research is important, but it, it, it is it is a large part of what we want to help people learn how to do when we do get out our Donna method. And so another part of our Donna method that we actually did kind of start playing around with is the the integration of the plot with the characters and the setting, because those three things are pretty much integral you you almost can't write a story unless you really have all three of those at least in your mind. They don't have to be completely detailed out. But it just helps so much to know who the people are, where they are, and when they are. And then what, what do you ultimately want to happen? So the, they all feed each other, especially in playwriting. But we're also trying our hand at a few other types of writing to help other people. And it, it, it's just, if you're telling a story, to me, those three things are just of equal importance. I agree, and that's why we had so much trouble starting it. Cause it's like, well, where do we start? Cause it's there's it's it's all equally important, and mm-hmm. they build on each other, and that's the same in the same way that when you build this world, they feed into each other, and it just makes writing easier. Mm-hmm. It makes writing so much easier, and to me, it does. And and then we can now talk about outlining. My daughter is a junior in high school, and when she has something to write. My first thing is, okay, we'll make a list of everything you want to include. And just, nope. Uh-huh. And, and as an English teacher, I, I just absolutely fought that with every student, practically every student I ever taught. It's like, look, yeah. just write down what you want to say uh, yeah. and then go back and fill it I in. I do the same thing. But they, they don't want to do that. They just, I guess they it feel like it's extra it work. so much, but it's not. It's not. It's less work. It's much less work. Because you put in, when you put in what you know... You have to say about in this essay and you realize, oh, I only have to come up with like a page of stuff. I thought it was three pages, but in reality, it would, you, the, the, the knowledge is already there. And just mm-hmm. what do you want to say? You just put it down and make that outline and fill in the outline and it it all works much better. Just make an outline for things. I mean, one of the first things we did whenever we were working on some uh, episodic breakdown stuff um, – for our job is we downloaded a template and just were mm-hmm. able to look at that and just like well, fill it in bada bing bada boom <laughs> it's is there how what is the format how what is be? the format yeah exactly yeah. so we transitioned heavily from um <laughs> and i'm not complaining no, no. um from like crazy youtube people and how they make money to to writing and stuff like that no, because i think <sighs> i'm just relating it to what we do but um, right so right. I, mean, right. I, I am interested in more YouTube stuff, though, because I really never was into it like you were. I mean, you started at 11, and you made, like, wrestling-type videos. And- uh, which, I, I tell you, those, to this day, like, those are what I got most views on. Because it was a very specific thing. Mm-hmm. It was only thousands of views, but it was such a very specific, like, kids wrestling. I had a channel name called, I had a channel name called um, DMK Kid Wrestling. It's called DMK because David and my friend Morgan, my friend Colin, DMK Kid Wrestling. And we just wrestled like on a trampoline and did like, fa- like planned it out like fake, like WWE type wrestling because <laughs> we were just all fans of it. We're like freaking 12 years old. And those views, those videos got thousands of views. In fact, I could have made money off of them. A very, 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 very small amount of money, like a couple bucks, but I could have. Which is really funny to me that I could have. and but well, it could have means that did they ask you to put ads? Or? No, but I just know now that, okay, I had thousands of views. Oh, I could go apply to like, I could go like set up an, a, a Google AdSense account and get the money. Like, cause so I had Google the, AdSense is where you ask YouTube to put ads on your videos? Yes, and, when, and, and the account set up for like... For where the money, for where the money goes, yeah, because you know Google owns YouTube, so okay, that's what that is. But yeah, like I made vid- videos on anything until um, and then I just stopped because like I was never trying to be a YouTuber necessarily. I was making funny because I liked making videos and 
It is interesting when I put in perspective, I've been editing videos since I was 11. I should give myself a little more credit. I've done lots of stuff. I've done lots of stuff. And then I made skit. I made the Daily Dent. Oh, the Daily Dent. <laughs> I love the Daily Dent so much. I might re-upload Daily Dent on Stay Creative because <laughs> it is so freaking funny to me. Um, and that's just kind of news or... It's like a, it's like a news... It is framed as a news program. But we're reporting on Shakespeare, uh, Beethoven, and Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> because we were doing a English project. Project, okay. Yeah. I love it, that. Yeah. But, it's, but we have, you put me and Alex Kidder and, and our friend Spencer and Michelle all together. And we're not going to follow an English project format. And just came up with this really weird thing. And people loved that. Did I ever tell you how we... Alex didn't want to put it on YouTube. He said, no, it's not going on YouTube. We're going to make CDs. And then I bought DVDs and learned how to burn DVDs. So I could burn that video onto DVDs. And I went to school and, like, passed it out to people. No, I don't think you ever did tell me that. Never so how did, that. how did you uh, persuade him to go ahead and put it on YouTube? Um, one day, like, years later, I just did it. Because, like, whatever. I just had it. I was like, oh, it's going on YouTube. Um, that, that's how. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like, after I made two. So, it was like I, like, like, I was a senior in high school whenever I'd finally, like, put it up there on YouTube. But I think that's funny that, that, that I walked around passing out DVDs. Like, we had cases, and I'm like, hey, you want to you want a DVD? And, like, it was written on sh with Sharpie on it, like, Daily Dent. Volume one, and we would autograph it and like <laughs> the stupid stuff. Well, see, I have yeah. no idea where any of those are. We only had 10. We passed out 10. 10 of them. I have no idea where any of them are. Probably most of them lost in the flood, actually, because a lot of people I gave them to. Yeah. But I, so I have no idea where they are. Um, so if you still have a copy of the Daily Dent, I'd like to know. I just yeah. want to know what happened to them. <laughs> well, I forget at, who I gave it to. I look at that as almost um, seeing your future. Like, you're going to be passing out something where people want your autograph one of these days mm -hmm. based on something that you've yeah. done creatively. You know, like, since I was 11, I've been, t I've been mm -hmm. made fun of. Like, oh, you're going to be a YouTuber? And I'm like, yep. Yeah. And I'm freaking eventually, uh, here we are. I mm -hmm. have made money. Like, money has been put into my pocket yeah. because of what we're doing. Right. So, it's like, so, big middle finger to everybody that... <laughs> You know, and like, and it's, I, I talked about it last time with my friend said he'll eat a sock. He's going to eat that sock. Oh, no, we're getting there. We're going to deep we're fry it. There. We're going to double deep fry it. He's going to cut it up with a fork. Yeah. So if you want to see if person eat, eat a sock, please like and subscribe and tell your friends. So to jump track completely, please. but it reminds me of something. Okay, I'm uh -huh. going to say two different things. So remind me to come back to um, the comment about... How much money I want us to make. That's what I'm going to come back to. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to say first is I am a published playwright and it's just through the catalogs that you can buy plays for schools. It's not like, you know, some of, none of this stuff I ever wrote is ever going to be on Broadway, but high school um, production companies or high school drama clubs and classes, they need plays too. And so if you want them, you just generally look through the catalog and find one. So one of the ones I wrote. Actually, the first one I wrote was with a student who had the idea to write a murder mystery, and it it and another one I wrote by myself for the most part are my two best sellers. So the murder mystery is called Scandal at Hampton Estate, and um, I probably need to get in touch with my publisher to be more readily available as a playwright. But one group asked a question to my editor who who forwarded it to me, and I found out where their production was going to be, and it was close to Memphis where my sister lives. So I actually made arrangements to go see the play because I really was so excited mm -hmm. to see anybody besides my students do the play. And the people were in a small town right above Memphis and they were so just overwhelmed that I was coming and uh, had dinner where everybody, all the cast ate and fed me and my whole family and brought me up on stage before the play. And I just remember having the feeling, this is what's going to happen to me. This is what it's going to be like when I... This is what I, it's supposed to happen. Yeah, and I I didn't even know you at the time. That's I right. I you were. I just knew that... Was I born? Uh, let me think when this was. Um, yeah, yeah, you were. So, um, it, it just... It, it, they were... They treated me like a celebrity. And I'm like, this is going to happen for me. 
I didn't know how and I didn't know when. I just, I've, I've always thought back to that. Like, that was the feeling I had when I was up on that stage. And it was just a small community theater in a small town. But it was the reception. The idea like, wow, mm-hmm. Donovan Moss is coming to our play. Wow. Mm-hmm. Just, they gave me flowers mm-hmm. on stage. They were just so thrilled to meet me. And I was thrilled to be there. So that was something similar to what you were saying. It but the, the money thing, I'm not trying to say that I'm doing this to be a millionaire. But at the same time, I've told David from the beginning, this is going to take off and we're going to have more money than we know what to do with. And so my way of dealing with money is very different than many because I, I don't fret over it. I have in the past, but at this point, I'm like, we have enough money to pay our bills and you know I'm not going to go out and buy a $50,000 car because at this point I know that that would put me in the hole, but I live comfortably. I have a nice home. We do drive reliable cars. I have a family of four and we all have a car. So there's also the car insurance and, you know, we have to eat and all these other things. But there was, we were, David mentioned the flood just a second ago. My family went through the flood and we had to deal with all that insurance money and just dealing with just the whole getting back in our house and refinancing our home for 30 more years after we could have paid it off for seven but before the flood. But anyway, so since then, there's just been huge influxes of money at different points because of the insurance money payoffs and whatever else. And then they'll get to where that money's kind of dwindled down. Sam went to LSU for a semester and that, that money, you know, hit me differently than the budget normally does. But I don't ever fret about it. I'm like, I got it. I'm fine. And then Danny and I had the option to refinance our house because he's a veteran and we have a veteran's loan and a VA loan and they offered a lower interest rate. So that actually let us skip two mortgage payments and they gave us money back. That was completely unplanned. I just, in my head, I'm like, I always have enough money. I always have enough money. Always, yeah. I always have enough money. So today, I'm trying to remember, I think we went through Starbucks. And I was thinking about the people that pay for the person behind you. And I was thinking about a day that I took my daughter to Chick-fil-A. And there was a group. I don't remember if it was somebody who was running for office or... I don't remember who it was, but there was a big group of people there who was pay, who chose to pay for everyone's Chick-fil-A from one time, like from five to seven or whatever they picked. And it, they didn't advertise it, obviously. They were just like, they were there. And when you got up to the drive through they would say, it's taken care of. And then they would like give you a card or whatever to tell you who. And I'm thinking, you know, these are the kind of things I want to be able to do for people. Like if uh, I, I agree. if I run into somebody I know who's just having a hard time. I like, I just carry a hundred dollar bills with me and I can just hand them a hundred dollar bill or I can go to Chick-fil-A and say, here's a thousand dollars. Just let it pay yeah. for the next, you know, I, the, I, I want to help people. I, I don't want to have money for me. Yeah, I agree. I, I want to have plenty. I've of money. always been the same way where I'm like, I have enough money. And by that, like, I just like, I'm like, oh man, I don't, I just want to eat a dollar cheeseburger. Um, that's, that's just me. And, mm-hmm. and I can, sit at home and eat raw. I'm like, I'm content. And I mean, of course, like I, I want to be comfortable, but that's what I want. That's what when I think about what, what I do with money. That's what I think about is that sort of thing. And how my friends pay for things and not having to worry, you know, like I'm the guy who like, and this is why I don't have as much money as I should. And it's, it's because I do things like this where when it's D and D night and I'm the one picking up snacks, I get there and I don't remind anybody to, pay me back you know mm-hmm. i don't um i don't say i mean if they do like cool but i'm not gonna be like because the, the, i used to be that kind of person mm-hmm. and it got really obsessive at mm-hmm. one point because i actually to be fair i i gave my friends a lot of money because i needed it for something and they owed me a lot and they wouldn't pay it uh so it, but that caused a rift in our friendship a big a big time and i still think and the thing is i think i was right in that argument where it's like, you owe me like a hundred bucks. I was, and I was like 16. I'm like, I was right. You should have paid me. And eventually they did. But what I realized was like, even though I was right, it was not worth being right. If it ruined the friendship. If it ruined my friendship with these people. And so I just stopped caring in that way. And you know, when I'm still, I'm not a pushover when it comes to that sort of thing at all. But I'm very happy to, I like giving I really do. I like cooking for my friend. I like to cook. I like to 
cook for my friends. Every time I make something, I text Andre and say, hey, I made this today if you want to come get some. Like, I like to do that. And I like to do the same thing for every for lots of people. And for mm-hmm. I, I'm the kind of person who thinks like, huh, I'd really love to have the money. Like when I see like a movie theater being torn down, it's like, I wish I had the money just to like give them the money. Like, oh, just run the movie theater or to show up to a play to show up, you know, a high school theater program and be like, oh, you need a new curtain? Oh, well, here you go. I got it. And just that's the that's the kind of person I want to be. It's like right. I want to be the kind of person who uh, jumps out of my car to get blankets for a, a child when they're going <laughs> into Walmart, but I want to bring it to a big bigger but scale. See, David, that to me it, it is you being who you want to be already. Like the the thing that that made me spark in this direction in the first place is like you see yourself being that kind of person. It, it's just a projection of what it, where it's headed. You're you're already there. We're just pushing it into the future. You know that that's how I see it. You know, I think you're exciting. right. I agree. It's just make on a bigger scale. It is in the future. That's exactly what it is. it's like. Um, what did you uh, earlier today? I said I want to learn to play the lute so I can be a bard, and you said you are a bard. I did. And that and I think was I right when that came when I said it came from Stacy who said um. Yes. Because we, we interviewed um, Stacy uh, Swearingen, an, an author, and he said, uh, you don't ever want to be a writer. You are a writer. You become an, an author. Yeah, but whenever, you are a writer. But you are a writer. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I want to be a bard. Like, you are a bard. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I don't play any musical instrument yet, but, like, I guess the will to do so. Mm-hmm. I sing in my car. I am a bard. I'd say. So do I. Yeah. So. And I want to bring it to a bigger scale and to play the lute, just like I, I'm, I'm a nice person i want to bring it to a bigger scale and solve mm-hmm. world hunger you know these are the things yeah. and I, it looks like i get so frustrated when people have so much money this can get into a whole thing that has nothing to do with creative conversation because i lo- i analyzed because i started think because ever since we started dealing with money and thinking about it i've been looking at this everything nothing in the world makes any sense at all when it comes to money what i mean by that is Okay, LSU costs an obnoxious amount of money to go to that school, and the dorms are disgusting. That doesn't make any sense. Where's the money? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Do you know how much money LSU made alone from their football this year? Well, football is a separate thing. And, but, but... I hear you. It, it, just, like, where's that... What? And But have you, have you been to that stadium? The stadium's pretty gross. So where's that money? <laughs> Nothing makes sense. As my point is, I'm saying... Do you get what I'm saying? I though? Do, I Nothing do, makes no, I do sense. have to say there is a huge argument there because even in the high school level, it's like, well, football gets this, this, that, and the other, but they're self-funded. And, it, you know, they do kind of have the monopoly on people who donate to them and then will not donate I, to I, people. I agree it's self-funded. I, I know that. Like, I, football just, takes I'm, their money. I know. I'm, but, I'm just but, saying there, there's always the whole, why do they get more? Well, there is a... They I, I know more. why they get more because yeah. they make more money. Right, right. But when they make that money, where, where what I'm go? saying, where does that money where does go? Because you, you can't pay the players. You can't, play, you can't pay the players if that's illegal. Mm-hmm. And the stadium is gross <laughs> and disgusting. Those bathrooms are not being uh, amped up. The seats are all there. Those are high school bleacher seats that you have to sit in when mm-hmm. you go there. So, mm-hmm. where I guess to a person or people, it does, it does make you wonder about stuff. it. Does make me nothing makes sense, and, and so I get frustrated when I'm like, why is why are there places in the world that don't have clean water? And people can say, like, the well, you know, t- uh, logistically speaking, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 logistics, you know, how you solve that problem, money, mm-hmm. and there's freaking plenty of it. Like, there is a person right now sitting here who, I understand that there's complexities to it. I'm not naive. I'm not stupid. I know that there are complexities to these sorts of things. But what I'm trying to say is that if I had the money, I genuinely feel that I would use the money to avoid the complexities. Because there are complexities, but those complexities can be subverted if you have enough money to do so. Because <laughs> what, what comes up is, well, you can't bring clean water because who's going to pay for the wells and who's going to pay for the mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be able to go, me, I'll do it. I hear you. You know what, you know what I'm saying? I I'm, not, I'm not trying to be naive. or I totally understand no, I, I how understand. money works very well. I think that way as well. I mean, there are these charts of like the top 20 richest people in the world and they have like more than... 99 uh, percent yeah, of the money of, of in the all, world yeah. yeah and i mean that's a dangerous very scary thing 
It's a very scary it is, thing. It is, it is frustrating and annoying and confusing. And it's like, who are these people? Mm-hmm. What the frick is going on? The world is like, everything just... I want people to have clean water, man. Oh, just to have nice, uh, livable conditions. You know, like, you know the whole Flint, Michigan thing with yes. the water in Flint, Michigan? Like, yes. how? Yeah, and why is it not fixed? I don't what? think it's fixed now. Okay, I think about, it's not fixed now. I think about stuff, you know, you know, around here, when there's road work, you know that that road work's going to go on for like four months, probably, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. In places, in other countries, I've seen videos where it's like, there's a freaking crater in the road they fix that in two days because they just do it Mm -hmm. and the thing is but everything is so built on uh and we learn about this kind of stuff in history where it's like um where people would be like well okay well we could fix it in two days but if we if we take four months to do it then they have to pay us more money and so (laughs) they schedule we're going to do this amount of work this day Mm -hmm. and and if one worker is getting too far ahead and i mean i've seen this kind of stuff like, like um if one worker gets too far ahead, then they're like, hey, man, tone it down because um, we need all the other workers to come in and be able to do work so they get their overtime. And, excuse me. And, and, and it takes like four months to do like the most mundane, stupid thing. There's this great episode of Parks and Recreation. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Parks and Recreation? I've heard of it. I haven't seen There's it. this great episode. Well, they do. They, it's like a city council and there's a pothole in a neighborhood somewhere. And they're like, there's like all these pay all this paperwork going through who's gonna fill the pothole and this guy ron swanson he's like he just stands up and gets in his truck and he goes to like home depot and buys concrete Mm -hmm. and buys the tools and goes to the pothole and fills it himself in a day because it's all it takes but it's there's so much bs and like bureaucracy bureaucracy and paperwork and making this paper pencil pushing it's scary and, and it's 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 scary and it's all built around people trying to get more money Mm -hmm. and so i just wish i had the money to be like hey flint here's Mm -hmm. here's some freaking water yeah dude well i have a story you're talking about the richest people we both Mm -hmm. were but uh that's different things catch my attention for different reasons on facebook and last night before bed somebody had asked bill gates something about who is richer than you And his answer was interesting. And so he said when he, before he had a lot of money, he went to the airport one time and he's trying to dig out change for a newspaper and he didn't have enough. And the newspaper vendor just said, just take it, it's fine. So he's like, no, really, I I, I will pay you back. The dude's like, no, just take the newspaper. I got it, I'm good. And so then um, a while back, a while later, I don't know if he said a few months or whatever, but again, later he came across the same exact vendor, same problem again, had money, didn't have the right change, didn't whatever. And the dude said, it's fine, it's good, here, just, you know, just take the newspaper. He Twice, same guy. So as Bill Gates moved up and got famous and everybody knew who he was, he realized that um, now that he had the means, he would like to go thank the man, you know, just let, make sure he knew that he helped him before he was somebody, mm-hmm. so to speak. So he found him after an extensive search. He went to airports until he finally found the same dude. And he walked up to him and said, do you know who I am? And the man said, yeah, you're Bill Gates. He said, I know, but do you know who I am to you? Like, do you know? He's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I helped you. I gave you two newspapers. He was like, well, I just wanted to thank you because, you know, and here's money. He's like, no, no, you don't need to do that. I helped you because I was able to. Yeah. I, I had the ability to help you, so you don't owe me anything. And so in Bill Gates' mind, that man was richer than him because he didn't need anything. He had everything he needed, uh, enough so to give people something above and beyond. I mean, he made his money selling newspapers, but he didn't need anything. And I might not be telling the story exactly right, but you get the point. Yeah, and I get the that point. It's yeah. just so interesting to look at that. Another reason that that came up is because Bill Gates, for a while, was working with sanitation, like trying to figure out a way across all these poor countries that, you know, the sewer gets mm-hmm. mixed in with the drinking water, like how he could help with sanitation. And that's huge. That's that's something, again, yeah. why can't we have... Well, when you have somebody who can throw money at it, I don't know, really know what efforts were actually made and how mm-hmm. much he got done in that direction, but for someone who was the richest man in the world, at least for a while, to say, hey, how can I help the world? Mm-hmm. That's pretty amazing. And it's it nice is. that at least there's one or two people yeah. out there. Ha, do you, you know Elon Musk? Yes. You know about... Uh, yes. the, okay, do you remember, like... Uh, probably about a year ago in like uh, I think like Thailand there were these um, 
students and a teacher trapped in an underwater cave. Do you, ever, do you remember that? Uh, vaguely. 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 All right. So they just were having trouble getting out. Elon Musk is like, hmm. Like, then he, so he and his team, um, I think his company's called SpaceX, right? Yes, um, yes. They invent this, like, underwater submarine thing that divers can use to get to them. They just invent it. And, like, he put, it's like, like he posted a video and like tagged him in a tweet. It's like, hey, I made this guy's for you. And it's them like in a swimming pool in like his backyard, like testing it. And they use that to like rescue him. And it's it's just it's just such an incredible thing where like Elon Musk is the kind of guy who like and Bill Gates are the kind of people. And this is a, a great. I think the reason they're kind of like this is because they did not come from rich families. Mm-hmm. And um, like um, Bill Gates, I saw the I read the story where Bill Gates and his daughter were at a restaurant and. The, his daughter tipped the waitress five hundred dollars, and Bill Gates tipped the waitress five dollars, and which, by the way, if I was Bill Gates, I would be like, "Here's thousand, but whatever." Um, so the the waitress goes, just kind of laughed a little bit, and he's like, "What's so funny?" And he's like, "Well, it's just uh, you're the richest man in the world, and you gave me five dollars, mm-hmm. and she gave me five hundred dollars, and he said, she her father is the richest man in the world." My father was a woodcutter, mm-hmm. and just that that and that's why they they do things like that. And Makes sense. It's just yeah, cool stuff. So I just wish, I, I I that is my biggest dream is to be able to be like is to go to where a problem is right, and talk to the person in charge and be like, why isn't that fixed? Because it always comes back to money. Mm-hmm. It's always going to come back to money. And so when I get to the point of the conversation where they go, well, it's going to cost blah blah blah. I want to be able to go. All right, I got it. Yeah, uh, give them a blank check. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like okay, it's solve the problem. And and truthfully, there's probably more to it where oh, it's much more you can solve the point. But then, but then there's much more where there's somebody who's selfish or an asshole mm-hmm. who's mm-hmm. excuse my language who's cop- stopping the thing from happening. And I'll throw money at them too until the problem it, it goes away. I mean, yeah. it, it's not that I know it's not that I'm just dreaming right no, now. I hear you. It's not uh, that simple. I'm well aware. I just. Uh, I hear you. Well, there's another story. Um, I pay attention a lot to Mind Valley, which is run by Vishen Lakiani, uh-huh. and um, he interviewed Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote the Conversations with God books, and they were talking about a specific incident where um, Vishen was at a restaurant, and somebody came. No, he watched somebody steal a phone. He saw somebody steal somebody else's phone. And in his mind, he thought, I feel so bad that I didn't intervene. That I didn't jump up and go run after this dude and tackle him mm-hmm. and make him give the phone back. And Neil Donald Walsh said, well, that wouldn't solve anything. What you have to do is tell the person who stole the phone that he can have the phone. But it does have all of your personal stuff on it. But if he needs a phone, here's some money, go buy your own phone. And if that's not enough to help you get out of this situation, here's even some more money if you need it for whatever you're, you know, whatever puts you in the situation that you have to run around stealing phones because that's just not who you are. That, that you don't come from a place where you know, all of us are more than that. And he was seeing him as a human who just had a problem and needed help instead of you're a victim. I mean, you're a, you're a uh, criminal and I need to, you know, like, stop you from being a criminal for, to anybody other than beat you down and put you in jail. He looked at it from how can I help you? And I just, that has stuck with me. Like, wow. <laughs> like if somebody stole my phone or my child's phone, I don't, I don't think I'd be wanting to run after them and like beat them to a pulp. But I would certainly not have the inclination to go up to that criminal in my mind and say, you know, if you need the phone, you can have it. What what else can I do to help you? <laughs> you just let me get right. my, my personal information off that phone. But, I mean, what a way to look at stuff, you know? But, yeah, that is a way. I mean, I have mixed feelings about that. Like, Right. I mean, I... I not always, you know. Um, like, okay, I saw this thing... Uh, the other day that was like uh this guy robbed uh, a gas station and let them know and said i'm sorry uh, my family needs money and but my first reaction is what about the guy who you robbed exactly. uh, his family needs money exactly. and mm-hmm. so i guess what um what, what, Neil, what, was, Neil, you know, what he's saying is that the way to truly solve the problem is for you to be in the posi- to be in the position where you can do that 
and say, let me help you. Mm -hmm. But if you're not in that position, I don't think anything is wrong with wanting your phone back. Uh, No, I I don't either. It's just, wow. The the way to solve the problem, and this is what I've heard a lot of successful people say, is like, yes, I put myself first. I'm very selfish. But because they are selfish, and once they have everything they need, then they're able to help everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the whole, like, give yourself the oxygen first in the plane crash. Like, you right. can't help your dying child if you die first. You, you right. have to help yourself, and then you can help the people near you. And there is a line there as well, because if helping yourself means having a Lamborghini and five houses on the coast, uh-huh. and, you know, it, it's it's all relative, but it's just such an interesting way to yeah. think about when we do hit it big, and we have plenty of money, I think we're both on the same page, because what we do have goals. We want a brick-and-mortar building. We want a recording studio and we want um, to be able to travel and talk and speak and help other people do what we do. But I want to eat bull chicks every day. I'm saying we I could just that uh, build that, build a restaurant adjacent to our. Yeah, you know, it'll, it'll be part of our our complex. That's a great idea. Yeah, we could even yeah. have a food court, and that would just be one of them. That'd yeah. be one of our favorite. And our employees restaurants. eat there for free. I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I want to be a good boss. Here's another big. I know we're getting to our time, but like, okay, you know, I like wrestling. Mm-hmm. In the WWE, um, the WWE does not provide health insurance for their employees. They also do not pay for their hotels or travel expenses because they're like, well, you're, you know, you're freelance, and it's like, I, my jaw dropped. I'm like, Jesus Christ! Like, you are a teacher, and I'm assuming you have health insurance from being a teacher, and your job does not involve throwing your body onto a hard mat every night. Well, but that's probably due. why. Uh, seriously. Because the, the right. risk is so much Right, right. you're right. But it's, like, it's ridiculous. We're like, they make all this money, and it's a, it, these kind of things piss me off, where right. it's like, what the hell? WWE makes so much money because they're doing shows in Saudi Arabia, even though that's like a very frowned upon thing. That they're doing shows there, but they're doing them because they're getting paid millions and millions of dollars by Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. to do a show there. So it's like, okay, so you have all that money, and you're getting them enough this bad thing, and then you're not even giving health insurance for the wrestlers who, like, it's just so frustrating. And I, I, I want to be a, a good boss and be able to mm-hmm. say, like, here's a food court, and oh, yeah. here's health insurance, and... And, um, th- you know, at the same time, in that case, you can be very selective of who you hire uh, to make sure you're getting good work out of them in order to right. give them these things. But uh, that, that's my that's my I think you're right. We do have goals, but I think we both are in the same mindset of our biggest goal is just to be able to help help dudes, help some dudes, you know, sure. and do that <laughs> as in women. Yeah. What a creative conversation. That was all over the world, man. I love it. I I mean, we didn't know where we were. That was how it's been for the last several times. We've had a sort of topic, but Mm -hmm. it just started somewhere and went where it went. And I had all kinds of thoughts in my brain. I didn't even come out. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I'm just saying that's that's what creative conversations do. It is a creative conversation. You're right. You know, I forgot to listen to our podcast from last week. I need to go back and do that. It's up right now. Go check it out. And 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 you you guys should all check it out, too. Yeah. And uh, don't forget to leave a like and a subscribe. Leave a comment. Tell us what you think. Check out all the links in the description below. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your grandmother. Tell the stepmom you don't like. Tell everybody. Right. They'll listen to uh, Creative Conversations with David and Donna. This has been Creative Conversations (laughs) with David and Donna. I'm David. And I'm Donna. We said David and Donna a lot. We sure did. But that's what we are. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm Donna. I'm, I'm David. All right. Stay creative.